algae a brief introduction what algae is all about and why the algae are important right so that is what uh, this video is all about so before we begin the discussion uh, if i ask you uh, to imagine something like planet's natural oxygen factory what image comes to your mind think about it for a minute so planet's natural oxygen factory so if you close your mind and think about this term then probably uh, if you're like me or uh, you know an average person in the world so you might be thinking about trees and which cannot be something like this isn't it so the trees are touted as uh, the the factory the, the the oxygen factory or lungs you know the amazonian rainforest is considered to be the lungs of the world right or cities small small green patches are like lungs isn't it and even many people say that uh, you know the best option for uh, a, a pollution air pollution is to plant more trees well it doesn't work that way you know air pollution has to be stopped at the source not by planting the trees trees cannot do much on the air pollution but coming back to this particular point the oxygen factory uh, as the uh, as the tree again that is a kind of a skewed representation you know so this is a very famous picture this is a real picture taken by apollo 17 uh, astronomers you know way back in 1972 at a distance of around 45,000 kilometers from the planet's earth surface you see from the space if you look at the uh, planet so this is how it looks like blue you know this is the the, the title of this picture it is called the blue marble like the small marble the glass uh, crystal marble that we use uh, during our school days to play in the field isn't it very small marble like uh, uh, you know in hindi call it as goli isn't it so this blue marble got the name blue from guess what ocean so we have almost 72 percentage of the planet earth surface with oceans you know so if you zoom in any of these uh, uh, blue areas in our planet Earth's surface, you will see the small, extremely small uh, plants. These are called picoplanktons, you know. In fact, these are cyanobacteria, you know. These are prokaryotic organisms. So picoplanktons are everywhere from the Arctic through the tropics to the Antarctic. If you take out a drop of water from anywhere in the world, world's oceans, you can see that uh, rich diversity of these picoplanktons that is nothing but cyanobacteria in it so uh, yeah of course i have wrote an article which featured in the dream 2047 that is a popular science magazine by a government of india you know it's a multilingual magazine in case you haven't uh, read it yet you can check it out it's only five rupees uh, from one side it's all in uh, english on the other side it's all in hindi right so uh, the title of this cover story is that two key organisms that may save earth you know so the two organisms are cyanococcus and prochlorococcus you might have never heard of this right if i say about this story especially in school the students uh, tell me that this looks like a tongue twister prochlorococcus is like a tongue twister yeah in one sense yes so and students kept on asking me like no i i love this uh, popularization of science you see and when i go to the school they ask me like do you believe in god then i said yes god for me god is nature yeah and do i have a prayer room i have a prayer room and guess what what is in my prayer room picture of these two algae cyanococcus and prochlorococcus do you know why it is a case all right, uh, these two algae contribute in oxygen production a lot. Do you know how much is that uh, oxygen production? 65 percentage in the air, in the atmospheric oxygen comes directly from just two genus of marine picoplankton. You know, extremely small size cyanobacteria alone produce 65 percentage of the oxygen in the air that we all breathe. So if I ask you, uh, let's stop for a while. I ask you to take a breath three times deep breath as in a you know as in a yoga or a meditation instruction take deep breath three times one two and three So out of these three times, two times comes directly from these two algae alone. Can you realize it? Prochlorococcus and cyanococcus. Two breath, 
out of three every three breath that you take two coming from the oceans this two genus alone is responsible for majority of this uh, you know carbon fixation on the planet earth you know 65 percentage of the oxygen fixation now you realize the importance of this picoplankton if you look the day, the geological time uh, the the earth's planet earth's history you can see that the the cyanobacteria originated cyanobacteria originated in archean eon you can see that so from the origin of life and subsequently the cyanobacteria originated cyanobacteria started uh, photosynthesizing you see flushing the, the atmosphere with oxygen much needed oxygen that uh, resulted in the formation of the ozone layer you know so archean through the proterozoic algae ruled the world that itself is a cyanobacter the picoplanktons ruled the world they flushed the world with oxygen and resulted in ozone layer you know and they are the first eukaryotes algae are the first eukaryote it's a red algae if you look at that oldest eukaryotic fossil ever detected is a algae it's a red algae and uh, land plants appeared much later in silurian uh, of the phenerozoic you know the paleozoic uh, time is when the the first terrestrial plants came in life you see so as you can see that most of the time in the earth's geologic history algae ruled it you see and some of the oldest fossils ever found on planet earth are algae stromatolites so this is a picture from darwin in australia you can see that it's 3.5 billion years old stromatolites are nothing but a cyanobacterial biofilm you know so these are structured biofilm one on the top of another forms this kind of rock like formation uh, it's 3.5 billion years old the oldest fossil on the planet earth you know one of the oldest fossil is this stromatolite you know and uh, guess what what is the smell of the dead body of the algae when the algae start decaying and you know after millions of years of the dead body how does it smells like the, the picoplankton or cyanobacteria to to get the smell of this algae uh, my favorite <laughs> example is just go to a, a gasoline station a petrol station you see 99 percentage of the fossil fuel comes from biomass of marine algae you know and the, the term fossil fuel itself uh, is uh, uh, you know that refers the fossil in that fossil fuel refers to the fossil of algae these are nothing but fossilized marine algae especially picoplankton the cyanobacteria you know planktonic cyanobacteria when this marine cyanobacteria dies it sinks deep down right uh, the ocean oceanic bed billions of kilo you know kilos of uh, uh, the algae you can see that every single day you know it's enormous right 72 percentage of the planet earth's surface is uh, covered with ocean you see that and these algae once it dies you know after uh, sinking deep on the uh, the uh, oceanic bed and because of the immense hydrostatic pressure so long chain hydrocarbon uh, started forming and that is the reason the petroleum started coming up after uh, millions of years of crushing in the uh, deep ocean bed you see so that is what the, the marine algae is all about the petroleum you see the petrol or diesel or kerosene or, or jet propulsion fuel everything because of the marine algae you see and coccolithophores so coccolithophores uh, are very common in the world's ocean emiliana huxley very beautiful coccolithophores i've covered coccolithophore earlier as well but one thing that not many people realize the, the importance of coccolithophores to planet-wide meteorological systems like monsoon you know so when this coccolithophores uh, die you know of course it can uh, produce this sort of a phyocystis uh, you know phyocystis is another uh, example of an algae that produce a froth you know so this picture i have taken this picture from antarctica you know the uh, this is uh, uh, this is from the eastern antarctica near larsman hills and these are oligotrophic lake so oligotrophic means nutrient poor right and even in the nutrient poor lake you can see the froth you know because of the bloom of this phyocystis so as you can see that when this coccolithophores and phyocystis uh, start uh, uh, i mean the, the bloom start degrading uh, especially after the the viral disease of this bloom uh, what will happen is that this algae releases a chemical called dms dimethyl sulfonate uh, you know or dmsp so these uh, dimethyl sulfide uh, helps the clouds 
to form you know the, the seed cloud forming or cloud seeding molecules so these molecules goes to that upper atmosphere and that result in the formation of the much needed monsoon cloud you see so this algae is in one sense responsible for uh, the the weather formation the rains very exciting piece of information isn't it and what kind of other kind of rain blood rain the rain which is uh, blood red in color you know no exaggeration yeah it has been reported way back in homer's iliad and also in bible uh, it is a it's a very well known uh, uh, ph phenomenon that happens almost every couple of years in south india especially in kerala and uh, sri lanka and we got the sample from this blood rain you know and we analyzed it and we published that uh, uh, finding and as you can see the media reports uh, earlier of, of, before our paper came in uh, media like Huffington Post is reporting that it's because of the alien rain extraterrestrial theories explode on unexplained files <laughs> you know they just want clickbait people to click it and read that, that that kind of story isn't it it's because of the extraterrestrial we are getting this kind of blood rain but actually the reason what we found is that it's it's an algae called trentipolia annulata it's an of ICA, you know so this is basically a sub aerial green algae trentipolials in of ICA is responsible for uh, this uh, you know the, the blood rain that is uh, uh, our group has published recently and uh, you know the, that could be an adaptation as well for spores dispersal because the, the, the spores of this algae gets dispersed uh, you know and goes to the atmosphere and then dispersed to a very wide area thousands of hectares together in form of this rain so it's basically the spore dispersal mechanism just like in the case of Indian milkweed or cotton the gossipium uh, you know the, the dispersal of its spores or seeds right in all case there is no seeds so it's only spores so it could be an adaptation too so that has been uh, reported in the in the media you know unraveling the blood rain mystery and algae is also responsible for uh, this kind of bioluminescent blooms so this is a bloom that has been reported last year uh, you know few months back actually in um, uh, in the maharashtra coast sindhudurga district you know so marvin shore of sindhudurg district so this one i have covered in curiosity curiosity by the way is a science show in my channel uh, in the youtube uh, it's a it's a monthly science show you know that covers uh, most of the uh, you know the bre uh, breakthroughs discoveries that has happened one month ahead right so last month so whatever has happened this month i, I cover in the curiosity so it, the, the reason of this nocticular bloom is now thought to be the snow meltdown in Himalayas see the connection Himalayan snow meltdown uh, linked with the algal blooms in South India see weather phenomenon is really amazing isn't it so this uh, snow meltdown in the Himalayas accelerate the nocticular algal blooms down south in the Arabian Sea uh, that is what a, a new paper uh, published a few months back says you know and the algae is also responsible for a large number of uh, things for example this is another story published a few months back in uh, in a, a central african country called botswana you know so in botswana the case happened that uh, bbc reports that a large number of elephant death and uh, later investigations revealed that the elephants uh, you know they were drinking water from uh, these kind of ponds and lakes infested with algal blooms so these hazardous algal blooms especially cyanobacterial blooms are responsible for uh, this elephant death you see so algal blooms have got ecological roles to play too or feasteria feasteria is a dinoflagellate you know so i've covered dinoflagellate earlier in this class lectures so feasteria is responsible for a large number of fish death and fish disease it can cause the fish disease and it's an infectious disease in the fish you know and algal extracts have got tremendous use even for a covid 19 uh, you know a treatment scenario uh, people are looking after the seaweed extract so in the, this is one one of the the news report published in cell discovery uh, one of the top you know journal in biomedical research cell discovery 
So it says that in cell studies, seaweed extract outperforms remdesivir in blocking COVID-19 virus. I published a few months back this story. So remdesivir is the only approved drug for COVID-19. You can see that. But this seaweed extract can outperform the remdesivir too. So that's very exciting, right? So the, this study looked at the complex sulfated polysaccharide, the fucoidans. The algae contains a large number of sulfated polysaccharides. Uh, extracted from the seaweed saccharina japonica saccharina is a kelp you know so this if you extract the, the saccharina then you can see the fucoidans in that and fucoidans is a complex sulfated polysaccharide responsible for you know uh, responsible for uh, the uh, the bioactivity of this particular compound you know so the only catch in this kind of study is that tons of treatment show the promise in cell cultures but fail for various reasons in clinical trials you know for example chloroquine so until you have put it through the human trials this is just a hype and hypothesis so always read this kind of uh, pieces of information with a pinch of salt and pepper you know so another very exciting uh, development in this field algal biotechnology happened uh, a few months back turbo booster photosynthesis could mean cars running on algae this is a, a team from cambridge university published in prestigious science journal nature so this is basically they, they could able to boost the photosynthesis the ps1 and ps2 of the, the algae you know the the microalgae so that uh, the microalgae can produce the the biofuel you see so this is what in science the paper artificial regulation of state transition for augmenting plant photosynthesis using synthetic light harvesting polymer materials so this kind of synthetic biology uh, and material sciences a lot of research is happening uh, you know so there is an exciting uh, field of uh, algal biotechnology you see a lot of biotechnology applications for algae do you know that algae that is diatoms are used in medical forensics yeah it, it can be used in uh, to see the the death by drowning you know uh, because these uh, lake bodies have got its own specific diatoms so to confirm that is it really drowned by death or if someone killed uh, a person and then subsequently put it in the uh, in the lake you know uh, to say that it, the, the person jumped in and died because of suicide you know so all these things can uh, can be revealed by looking at the lung tissues uh, during the post-mortem they can uh, remove the, the lung tissue and look under the microscope uh, then you can see that diatoms and it can also tell you that if somebody was killed in some other lake you know few kilometers away and subsequently took the dead body uh, deliberately and uh, it, you know introduced into another lake just to give an alternative narrative you know uh, to confuse the police so that can also be revealed by looking at the the kind of diatoms inside the lungs because each lake has got its own endemic diatom species so that is why diatoms a lot of species in it each small pond ha might be having its own a new species of diatoms you know so that is that is one reason uh, that diatoms are useful in medical forensics medicines from algae a, lo a large number of uh, uh, you know marine natural products have been characterized till date and some of these have been entered into clinical trials and also uh, as a as an approved uh, you know medicine right especially anti-cancer drugs like halide f is from uh, bryopsis right many algae are edible and are quite expensive some of the uh, most expensive plants in the world are algae like porphyra are very expensive right and these are edible in certain uh, countries of the world especially in the eastern asian countries algal farming uh, also called mariculture you know so uh, yeah uh, sometimes the seaweed is referred as sea vegetable you know because weed has a negative connotation like weedicide you know uh, like in the terrestrial uh, crop you know in the agriculture the weed is always unwanted but seaweeds are not like that seaweeds you know that the term itself is a misnomer and that is why uh, you know the people the algal biologists are saying that seaweed you should refrain from using that term instead you can call it a sea vegetable if it's an edible algae otherwise just say marine algae marine macro algae you know so seaweeds are nothing but marine macro algae sea as in marine 
and uh, weed is basically something to do with macro algae, macroscopic algae, you know. So uh, farming that means basically how uh, the cultivation of this algae in the near shore as well as in the offshore, uh, so called mariculture. Mariculture is by the way is uh, a term for marine agriculture, mariculture. So mariculture is not merely for the algae but also for uh, other, you know, the fish, shellfish, all those things comes under the term mariculture, you know. So it needs no fresh water. So that is the biggest advantage of the seaweed farming if you compare that with uh, the normal agriculture, you know. So agriculture, uh, you know, agriculture that is in terrestrial land, right? It needs land, pre precious land, right? And fresh water, you need fresh water. But for mariculture, you need, you need nothing, no land, no pesticide, no fertilizer, no herbicide, nothing is required. Algae can simply grow. Uh, in a, uh, uh, in the sea, you see, so that uh, that kind of seaweed farming is very exciting uh, piece of uh, uh, you know piece of avenue, right? For uh, because the world food crisis is real, and uh, overpopulation is also real. We really have to see how to feed millions of human population that is uh, uh, you know that is going to be uh, flooding the planet Earth in in a couple of decades. So we really have to think about it, right? So uh, for seaweed farming, we all need is just ocean and that we have a plenty, isn't it? India is uh, India has a very uh, long uh, coastal region, right? We have uh, uh, almost 14,000 kilometers of the coastline, right? So that is why we, we need almost nothing else. Just we need coastline and ocean for farming the seaweeds. Uh, it's pitted as a future of the agriculture to ensure the food security. Uh, for world food security is one of the UN sustainable development goals as well. You can uh, think of it. And yes, our Prime Minister uh, Modi, uh, uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said multiple occasions the importance of farming of the seaweeds. So there is a lot of uh, interest on these lines coming, uh, you know, in India. So the, the shift is going from the agriculture now to the, uh, you know, to the this uh, the blue economy that the seaweed farming. That is where the, the interest is now into, you know, the, the farming of seaweeds. And the, the algae is also important uh, as a source of the, you know, the biofuels like Botria coccus brownie is a green microalgae. And the lipid content of this green algae is very high, 40 percentage of the dry weight. Uh, you can compare that with uh, the oil seed plant, Jatropha. You know, the dry weight of uh, uh, only 32 percent of the dry weight of Jatropha seeds is uh, the lipid but for this algae the dry weight of this algae 40 percentage so it's much higher than the trophy, you know the, uh, in the lipid content wise so it's a microalgae you can easily cultivate inside the photobioreactors photobioreactor by the way is just a normal reactor bioreactor to cultivate the the you know microbes but it has got additional facility to to uh, ensure the light uh, you know the in, uh, input so it's basically illuminated uh, bioreactor is known as photobioreactor usually photobioreactors are made out of glass with illumination in it you know so botryococcus brownie is a top candidate for the biofuel production you know and uh, yes algal diversity we still don't really know much about the algal diversity how many algae are there and for example this is one of our paper published a few years back and this is the uh, it's a very bizarre kind of algae algae growing inside another algae you know this is a host algae it's a cladophora and inside cladophora you can see that ulvella ulvella is growing inside ulvella leptokit is growing inside the uh, the host algae so this kind of algae is known as endophytic algae you know of course algae can grow inside other algae as well right and there are several epiphytic algae too you know the algae growing on the top of the other algae or other plants like uh, sea grass so we still need a lot of effort to characterize its real biodiversity and so as a freshwater algae so algae doesn't mean everything is uh, you know marine there are terrestrial as well as freshwater algae uh, for example trentipolia which i uh, introduced while talking about uh, the blood rain is a terrestrial algae you see uh, triboxia is also a terrestrial algae. Triboxia is found often uh, as a phycobiont, that is a photobiont of the lichen. You know, uh, lichen itself is a algal component, the photosynthetic algal component plus fungi, isn't it? So that kind of symbiotic system is known as lichen. 
so that is also an example of a terrestrial algae so we have uh, in in terms of habitat we have terrestrial algae we have freshwater or limnetic algae and then we have marine and estuarine algae you know estuarine means salinity is little bit lesser than the the marine the ocean you know estuary is like the river mouth so marine and estuarine algae then we have limnetic algae the freshwater algae and then terrestrial algae so limnetic algae some examples are volvox a colonial beautiful uh, globules uh, with the division of labor you know volvox is an exciting algae uh, that is often time used for uh, you know for inferring how the eukaryotes evolve from the prokaryotes you know so especially within the eukaryotes uh, you know multicellularity how the multicellularity and division of labor you know the organ system how did organ system develop from uh, the you know this uh, macroalgae हेलो कहा है जी आप आ वो है ना गर्ग का हाउस है उधर दे दिया ओके वन टू फोर ठीक है जी अदर एग्जांपल्स ऑफ द फ्रेश वाटर ऑल गे इंक्लूड्स क्लमाइडोमोनास सेनेडस्मस राइजोक्लोनियम uh, all these are examples of the you know the the freshwater algae of course our lab is also looking for the freshwater algal biodiversity of punjab you know so kara is another example of the freshwater algae kara is a very interesting algae you know because a kara is a most uh, you know recent common ancestor with the land plants uh, it's a, it's kind of an algae but uh, in fact kara is a uh, you know it's it's not a, uh, it's not really a, a chlorophyte you know so that is why uh, as you can see the chlorophyta and embryophyta so it's right in the root of these two embryophytes and chlorophyte is a carophytes you know so the streptophytes and carophytes are, are on the base of the embryophytes so cara virgata or cara vulgaris are the stone words you know stone words so this is also uh, classically grouped as a green algae the cara you know so spirogyra is another example of the freshwater algae you know so algae is also part of our uh, human civilization with rich tapestry of information in japanese you know ancient japanese literature uh, this is a paper i analyzed some of the waka poetry waka is a uh, you know ancient japanese uh, short poem uh, especially something to do with the uh, uh, human emotions as well as the nature yeah so this is a poem uh, from Shinko Kinshu, Love Poems by Minamoto no Toshiyori. You know, Minamoto is a place name, no means of, Toshiyori means elder, you know, elder of the Minamoto, that is the pseudonym uh, of the poet. Uh, he lived from uh, 1055 AD to 1129 AD. So, uh, this particular piece of this uh, waka, if you translate that, this is how it looks like. In the bay of Naniwa, Naniwa is a place in Japan, seaweed covered gemstone rocks appear just so does my love for her. So here the poet is comparing uh, his love to that lady is uh, like uh, the seaweed covered gemstone rocks. Look at that how much uh, precious the seaweed is in this poet's imagination, right? So that reflects the mindset of the Japanese in those period and even today. Uh, Japanese and most of the East Asian countries are, uh, you know, the, the seaweed is part of the uh, uh, culinary delicacy, you know, the, the regional uh, culinary. And not just in Japan, and also, the, you know, seaweed is part of the culinary in uh, Northern Europe, like Norway, and also in the Northern Britain, like in Scotland, and also in Canada and South American, some of the South American countries like Brazil and Chile, you know, uh, seaweed is very much part of the uh, the uh, food daily food habit the gastronomy and guess what there is a very exciting link between those countries who are eating the seaweed which is part of the uh, you know the their traditional food with the incidence of cancer you know that is called the seaweed paradox the highest seaweed consuming countries including in east asia japan korea china indonesia and philippines Somehow India is not part of it. You know, in India we don't have any culture of eating the seaweeds in our food, isn't it? So in Europe, Ireland, Ulster and Wales and also Norway, you know, of course. And coastal areas of the US and Canada, 
you can see in those regions prevalence rate of the following diseases are very low in all these countries breast cancer colorectal cancer coronary heart disease all these are very low especially colon cancer colorectal cancer you know it usually the colon cancer get diagnosed when you are uh, uh, at the end of your life you know almost fourth stage end of life it doesn't mean that you are uh, old you know maybe you are young but usually the detection is at fourth stage so we can we can't do anything about it you know so the the colon cancer rate is much lower in those areas where seaweed is part of the food so there must be some connection between eating seaweed with uh, you know with the uh, uh, likelihood of having less likelihood of developing cancer later in your life you know so it's something like french paradox right so there is something to do with the coronary artery disease the coronary heart disease the french paradox in france so algae derived marine natural products there is a rich tapestry of the, the natural products and biomolecules found nowhere else on the planet earth except in the in in algae so there is a uh, there is a large number of research is focusing on uh, finding the drugs from the algae uh, we have a project running uh, supported by ministry of earth sciences drugs from the sea a project so that has recently been concluded so we can see that there are a large number of natural products from the algae for example colahalide f from bryopsis which is a green algae sulfated polysaccharides phycoidin and laminarin from a various brown algae including laminaria digitata and fucus you know sulfated polysaccharides translam from laminaria which is a brown algae sulfated polysaccharide ulvan from green algae ulva you know Contriamide A, a cyclic dexypeptide, contria, you know, terpenes and triterpenes from various algae, including bifurcaria, bifurcata, caulerpa, cystostera, and cystophora, and also bis ether, that is BDDE, and other bromophenol, phenol containing uh, bromine group, you know, various marine macroalgae. So, yes, algae can be a potential source of the drugs so there are a lot of active research going on this line as well and of course uh, symbiotic system you know the coral reef we appreciate the coral reef the beauty of coral reef in uh, documentaries of uh, david attenborough in bbc for example so but we uh, overlook the importance of the algae in it so yes the coral reef are growing all because and thanks to its uh, you know photobiont or phycobiont yes zoog santile it's because of the algal component you know uh, which is a, a dinoflagellate right algae uh, zoosanthellae isn't it symbiodinium is the genus uh, responsible for uh, the, the you know giving the coral its life so when the symbiodinium is dead the nidarians that is the coral uh, animals cannot sustain you know most important component of any coral reef ecosystem is symbiodinium the, the dinoflagellate and also the lichens if you look at that lichen lichen is nothing but an algae plus fungus you know so there is a fungal component and there is a, an algae common the phycobiont and the mycobiont and most importantly uh, phycobiont plays a crucial role because phycobiont is the one which is responsible for photosynthesis and that enables a mycobiont to live in you know and without uh, uh, you know phycobiont uh, the fungus cannot live but without fungus algae can live you know that is why the algae is most important component and guess what what is really happening in the world of the oceans if you look at that uh, the coral reef uh, only a very less number of coral reefs are uh, you know uh, accessible to us now nowadays most of the coral reefs suffer something called bleaching that is happening all around the world including our own lecture tube you know and what makes this coral reef bleaching bleaching by the way is that the, the the live coral reef ecosystem becomes dead you know it becomes like this uh, just uh, you know just uh, monochrome just white color and the reason is that because co2 get mixed with ocean and that forms the production of the carbonic acid and that brings down the ph of the world's ocean you know and that is the reason why uh, the the ocean is getting acidified and what is the repercussion yes the algae gets suffered you know especially symbiodinium symbiodinium is a component i told you it's a it's a zoosanthellae the most important partner of coral reef and when this algae dies coral reef can no longer photosynthesize you know and it's complete devastation of the entire 
uh, ecosystem that is what is happening it's not just coral reef but associated flora and fauna including large number of fish and most of these fish are endemic so we are losing tremendous amount of biodiversity because of this climate change you see so uh, the algae can also be used for climate change mitigation um, climate change mitigation means to reverse the effect of the climate change how can we do that because algae has been doing that for millions of years on the planet earth rather billions of years i would say almost last two billion years uh, since the beginning of uh, Archean when the cyanobacteria formed you see they have been doing the same thing the mitigation the climate change mitigation it removes the CO2 from the atmosphere and removal of CO2 is achieved because algae can photosynthesize and during photosynthesis CO2 gets absorbed you know and that that is something called fixing right carbon fixing right photosynthesis CO2 absorbs from the atmosphere and they fixed into uh, into the biochemical that's exactly that is what we burn these days as a petrochemical right petroleum and uh, hydrocarbons right so removing the excess co2 from the atmosphere is something called carbon sequestration and planet-wide carbon sequestration factory is nothing but algae because algae sequester for majority of the co2 on the planet earth you see so algae does the majority of the natural carbon sequestration helping us to mitigate the climate change and think if the algae is not there what would have happened of course uh, there won't be any co2 you know we cannot remember the three breath that we took two breath is only from the algae isn't it so uh, of course co2 will not uh, the oxygen will not be there and what will happen to the co2 if you think of it uh, atmospheric co2 won't get uh, fixed by the algae so the sequestration won't be happening so excess co2 gets accumulated on the, our atmosphere leading to tremendous uh, greenhouse effect and no one can live on the planet earth it will be extremely hot it will be super hot you know hot house earth so that is going to happen you know? hot house earth that is what the climatologists say so without algae uh, the things are twice uh, the two problems the first problem there won't be any oxygen second one is that co2 will be extremely high because uh, natural carbon sequestration will be hampered so that is why as you can see here this is how the algae uh, you know as depicted here uh, right so does the carbon sequestration water from the seawater with the atmospheric co2 with the help of sunlight get fixed into the biomass that forms into the petroleum finally so that is the natural uh, sequestration that is done by the the planet's algae you know and yeah that is the same uh, photosynthesis is dual edged co2 gets sequestered as well as oxygen is re released and i told you 65 percentage of oxygen on the planet earth is coming from the algae alone 